Dean Galino for the introduction and thank you very much audience for your interest and attention to the lectures that have made up this series. I remember making a similar speech to this approximately 19 years ago. Similar in that I was doing the talking and similar because there was an audience of spectators such as you. But there were many differences too. I was much younger and it was a high school valedictory address filled with words and ideas that only a high school youngster could comfortably espouse. <laughs> and even more different was the audience and the setting. For the audience was made up of only Japanese and it was given at the graduation exercises in a war relocation camp a euphemism for a concentration camp. Although it is difficult to remember the exact words of the address for which I am thankful, I do recall asking with all of the dramatic power that a high school youngster can. I don't know why we're here. I don't know where we're going, but I'm sure that things will work out. Now that I think back on these words, certain facts become obvious. I think there is enough evidence, political, economic, and otherwise, to give a clearer picture of why we were evacuated. And at the time of the speech, there was no reason for asking where I was going, since it was obvious that it was back to the barrack that was assigned to me as my living quarters. Therefore, the crucial question was the last, where we were going. And it is here that the most amazing answers lie. For if I had thought at that time that within the next two decades, I was to be giving a lecture such as this, as a member of the staff at UCLA to such an audience, it would have been just a matter of time that people in white jackets would have whisked me out of the War Relocation Center and into another kind of institution to handle problems of people who had somehow lost touch with reality. <laughs> this illustration is especially relevant in discussing and analyzing the progress made by this specific group in the United States. For if it can be shown that such changes can be made in 20 years, it may provide a more optimistic frame of reference as we view the current problems of integration. There will be three general areas that I will cover during my lecture here tonight. One will be a historical analysis of the Japanese using various sources as a technique for illustrating possible changes in the public image of this group. The second part of the lecture will cover a more difficult area. It will be an attempt to understand certain structures and features within the Japanese population which might help to explain the behavior of this group. Such an understanding should be helpful in analyzing both the progress and the setbacks made by this group. Much of this material is drawn from a current study which I am directing titled Japanese Crime and Delinquency in the United States. I would like to add that the reason for this study was primarily because of the lack of crime and delinquency in the Japanese population, which is rather unique since the usual studies concentrate on groups with high crime rates. The third and last area will attempt to look at the current picture and to show where the Japanese is. At the end of this formal analysis, I will be most happy to entertain questions from the audience. And the history of the Japanese. The lot of the Japanese, especially in California, has not always been a happy one. Prejudice and discrimination, both legal and otherwise, has followed the Japanese and other Oriental groups ever since the first immigration in the late 1800s. For example, the San Francisco Chronicle on February the 23rd, 1905, started a series of articles with the following captions. 
Crime and poverty go hand in hand with Asiatic labor. Brown men are an evil in the public schools. Japanese a menace to American women. Brown Asiatics steal brains of the white. And the same paper on May the 8th, 1905 stated, the Japanese are not an inferior race. They are our equals in intellect. They can learn, they can think, they can invest, and their ability to labor is equal to ours. They are proud, valiant, and courageous, but they are not of our race, not of our blood. In the offspring of a marriage between a Mongol and Caucasian, the characteristics of the Mongol always predominates. All elements of a race that cannot come here and mix with us become blood of our blood, bone of our bone, without degrading or debasing us, must be kept out. And as early as 1900, the first organized anti-Japanese meetings were held in San Francisco, sponsored by a labor council, to object to the Japanese as being unassimilable, as undermining existing labor standards, as lacking in proper political feelings for American democratic institutions. Planks from the Exclusion League platform, which were passed, included, one, members pledge themselves not to employ or patronize Japanese, nor patronize any person or firm employing Japanese or dealing with products coming from such firms. Two, urging the school board in adopting a policy segregating Japanese from white children. Three, a propaganda campaign calling the attention of the President and Congress to this menace. And four, that all labor and civic organizations in California be asked to contribute a fixed assessment for the cause. That these were not isolated instances can be garnered from an unpublished dissertation by Dr. Charles Reynolds at Stanford University in 1927. He surveyed the files of a small town newspaper and found that the Japanese raided 20,453 inches of newspaper space during a specified period. The general attitude reflected in these items was that of, quotes, irritation verging on hostility, end of quotes. He also found that there were peaks and depressions in the amount of space devoted to the Japanese, which he was able to correlate with election years and periods of economic depression. And from the Japanese side, an interview with a Nisei, a second generation child, shows the following picture. Quotes, our gang was to go swimming in one of the public pools, and when I got to the window, they said I could not go in. They would not tell me why I could not go in, and so my gang came out and they asked why I could not go in. Then the man came out, and he said that no Japs were allowed in the pool. One of my American friends who was with me began to cry because he was just as much hurt as I was over the incident. He said that he would never go to that pool again. And in all the years that I knew him, he kept his words, end of quotes. And the confusion in the minds of many Nisei, born of Issei parents but living in the United States, can be seen in the following interview. Quotes, I sat down to American breakfasts and Japanese lunches. My palate developed a fondness for rice along with corned beef and cabbage. I became adept with knife and fork and with chopsticks. I said grace at mealtimes in Japanese and recited the Lord's Prayer at night in English. I hung my stocking over the fireplace at Christmas and toasted mochi at Japanese New Year. <laughs> On some nights, I was told bedtime stories of how Admiral Togo sent a great Russian fleet down to destruction and on other nights I heard of King Arthur or from Gulliver's Travels and Tom Sawyer. I was spoken to by both parents in Japanese and English. I answered in whichever was convenient or in a curious mixture of both.
And in many families of Buddhist faith, the song, Jesus Loves Me, Yes I Know, came out as Buddha Loves Me, Yes I Know. <laughs> the Japanese American Mirror, May the 5th, 1939, related the following incidents. During Boys Week, Nisei high school students were classified among the undesirables to fill red-blooded American posts. Many cases came to light where Nisei girls and boys were denied permission to attend class dances because of race restrictions at country clubs that were in force. Again, there are countless cases where Nisei students report teachers making unsavory remarks about the tyranny of Japan against the helpless, how embarrassment resulted due to their classmates craning their necks about or casting caustic looks. For, in the minds of the majority, all Japanese, whether born in the United States or abroad, were assumed to be alike. The culmination of the drive against the Japanese reached its highest point with the wartime evacuation. Bruce Lee, writing in a magazine of September 1962, says, but talking about the wartime evacuation, never was a great principle lost so casually as with the Japanese American. The basis of all civilized law is that punishment is designed only for individual criminal behavior. Yet 113,000 people were forcibly removed from their homes, denied the right to work, and stripped of everything they owned. They were confined behind barbed wire fences and guarded by rifles and fixed bayonets. Every constitutional and social right was taken from them. And yet, within two decades after the wartime evacuation, almost miraculous changes appear to have taken place. For example, recent newspaper editorials emphasize words such as fine upstanding citizens, loyal Americans, a group with fine traditions, clean, hardworking, and a credit to our country. The Los Angeles Examiner, in an editorial dated August the 15th, 1961, in discussing Nisei Week said, the Nisei Festival is in large part symbolic of the recovery our Japanese neighbors have achieved from the hardships, deprivations, and expropriations they suffered in California during World War II. It is a credit to the industry and vigor of fine people who bore misfortune courageously, rejected its memory, and resumed with dignity the cordial relations so unhappily interrupted. The second part of the lecture will try to give you some understanding of the behavior of this group. Such an analysis should be of value in giving us clues as to why the group has behaved as it has. I would like to emphasize that the hypotheses presented are quite exploratory and empirical validation is still unavailable. We are currently designing a study to provide this validation. One of the first things that one can notice in most Japanese is the high degree of social and personal conformity. I call this the area of social controls and what would like to present several concepts that might provide better insight as to how this control is achieved. I will use the Issei, or the original pioneers, as the basis with the understanding that there have been and will continue to be modifications as the group becomes more acculturated to the mores of the larger culture. One of the most important variables is the pattern of social control leadership and obedience that arises from what I would call the vertical structure of the Japanese community and family. Most Japanese are structured on an adult child model, even in terms of voluntary social groups, so that adult authority and leadership is usually present. 
This vertical pattern is especially evident in the Japanese family, where there is a high degree of formal control invested in the father. This is in direct contrast to the more preva prevalent American model, which appears to be based more on peer-peer relationships. What this means in terms of behavior appears to be relatively simple. For the Japanese, leadership and guidance comes from adults, or generations down, whereas in the American scheme, leadership and guidance very often means the delegation of responsibility to the peer group. The acceptance of this American model is the most dramatic in American high schools, where peer approval in terms of dress, mannerisms, and other forms of behavior appear to be almost completely unrelated to the, desi to the desires of the parent or other representatives of the larger culture. Another type of control exerted upon members of an ethnic group is through the ability of the community to provide resources and opportunities. Essentially, the ability of the Japanese group to provide schools, churches, mutual aid societies, newspapers, recreational and social activities, as well as employment, reinforces the controls of the community over its members. Again, in its simplest terms, social control is enhanced when each member and family perceives the community as providing services and opportunities that he or she desires. The concept of independence dependence is closely related to the area of social controls. The dependence of the child on his family and interdependence between the family and community enforces the communication and cohesion between the actors. The Japanese individual was highly dependent upon his family for socialization and economic sustenance until he reached adulthood. The highly dependent relationship led to a high degree of social controls. Other variables which lead to greater so social control can be conceptualized as primarily related to the individual or to the psychological self. Here I would include such terms as shame and guilt, that is, the internalization of certain standards and norms of behavior. If a person feels shame or guilt over certain acts, then societal control over the individual becomes greater. It is our hypothesis that the process of internalization of certain standards and the subsequent reactions of both guilt and shame reached a high point among the Japanese pioneers. The last variable I will mention in this section is the area of relationships. It is probably the most important factor in determining the degree of social control exerted by one actor over another. In other terms, it would be the area or risk or of losing something through one's own behavior. For it is then critical that some kind of relationship be established. One might call it love, respect, or what have you. Then the risk of losing this relationship becomes important in determining the degree of social control. Conversely, one who has nothing to lose because there was nothing in the first place is beyond the area of social control. If this concept has validity, it can also be conceptualized on different levels. For example, larger groups, societies, and nations. Unless relationships are established between white and Negro, country with country, there would appear to be little hope for the kinds of interaction leading to higher levels of communication, understanding, and respect. It appears to be a common observation in child development that the parent who reinforces behavior only through threat, hate, rejection, and punishment eventually loses control over the youngster. It is not unusual for such children to think, quotes, I've got nothing to lose as there was, any, there was never anything between me and my parent in the first place. It appears to be a simple truth, yet many people either through ignorance or ill will, continue to behave in such peculiar ways by not establishing any type of relationship towards other people or nations, which destroys whatever hope of communicating and understanding one's fellow man. 
Another area for understanding human behavior deals with, I would call, the content of what is learned. By understanding some of the norms held by the Japanese and their ability to reinforce these behaviors through the controls hypothesized in the previous section, we should add greatly to our knowledge of the specific group. I will discuss three main areas, what I will call means and masculinity, femininity, and styles of life. One, means ends. Definitions of success and the means for achieving this success are important variables. If, for example, the purpose of playing a game was solely to win, then the means utilized towards achieving this goal might be less open to question. Possible phrases to describe this norm might well be, nice guys don't win, do anything but don't lose. The opposite side of this picture would be those groups and individuals who would say playing the game according to the rules is as important as winning the game. I would call this the concentration either on ends or goals as opposed to a concentration on the means towards achieving the goals. It is my opinion that the Japanese emphasize the means or ethical way of doing things as being just as important as the ends or goals. This type of orientation would then give emphasis to minor tasks as being equally as important as the major ones. And this approach would probably help us to understand the formal ethical behavior of many Japanese, even under the conditions of the wartime evacuation. Number two, masculinity femininity another type of orientation lies in the role prescriptions given by a group towards definitions of masculinity and femininity let me explain this concept as it pertains to male behavior in certain cultures it is believed that to demonstrate or validate validate masculinity one must quote act out end of quotes or to be aggressive economically, socially, and sexually. There is also a related narrowness to this definition of masculinity. Certain activities such as poetry and art were precluded. And in certain societies such as ours, the male role may be ill-defined and ambiguous. Therefore, males may be constantly forced to prove their identif identity through forcefulness, aggressiveness, competitiveness, and physical prowess. Conversely for the Japanese, it may be that maleness is already an ascribed role through birth, and that the need for validation through acting be out behavior is not as mandatory. Therefore, it would not be unusual to find men in a variety of different professions and positions in Japan such as the female role in the kabuki theater without a loss of male identity. This might help to partially explain the relative low rates of delinquency in the Japanese group. Number three, styles of life. By styles of life, I would include the Japanese orientation towards time, their emphasis on academic achievement, high education, and high savings, and their realistic expectations towards life in the United States. On these dimensions, the Japanese are virtually identical with the tenets of the Protestant ethic, or in more common usage with the American middle class. For their time perspective is geared towards the future, and they believe in delayed gratifications as illustrated by the following interview. Quotes, we never bought anything on credit. We paid cash and bought only what we needed. It is much better to wait than to get everything now. Times have changed, though. My wife has a credit card, and she does most of her buying that way. My children keep telling me, why wait when you can enjoy things now? There appears to be little need in further discussing the high value that the Japanese have placed on education. 
academic achievement and high savings, as there is much research evidence to back these points. The last area for analysis, therefore, lies in the area of expectations. Both psychologists and sociologists look upon expectations as an important variable in understanding deviant and non-deviant behavior. For example, Merton's concept of anomie focuses on the discrepancy between expectation and legitimate channels for fulfillment, while Seaman, a member of our faculty, utilizes expectations as an integral part of alienation. And Roeder, a psychologist, says, the occurrence of the behavior of a person is determined not only by the nature or importance of goals or reinforcements, but also by the person's anticipation of expectancy that these goals will occur. The Japanese had what I would call realistic expectancies for life in the United States. For example, an old Issei says, we expected very little, so we were seldom disappointed. We didn't need fancy clothes, big cars, expensive entertainment. We were thankful for food and a place to sleep. We worked hard under all conditions. Our wages were very small. This didn't bother us. We learned to work hard without complaining. And we also tried to teach these things to our children. I am not too sure we succeeded. Few Issei expected to be wealthy. Few expected social integration into the larger community and indeed very few achieved any success in these areas. And probably very few, it might be added, were in an anomic or alienated state. <coughs> the purpose of bringing you this section was to present a few variables which might help to explain the behavior of the Japanese. I would like to make it very clear that I, I am not advocating these behaviors as being necessarily all good or all bad. As for all behaviors, some appear to be functional for the group and others dysfunctional. I personally believe that the price paid for the degree of social controls appears to be rather high. Uh, the last section of this lecture will try to cover where the Japanese are now. Uh, it is extremely difficult to assess the current stage of the integration of the Japanese in the United States. For there are many groups, the Issei are the first generation, Nisei the second generation, and the Sansei the third generation, as well as Japanese recently arrived from Japan and Hawaii. There are also many following the rural to urban migration patterns of the majority culture. Therefore, generalizations appear to be tenuous, but here are a few statistics which appear to be of interest and value to the discussion. For what they may be worth, there are several. All right, income. Utilizing U.S. Census data for 1960 median urban income, the following groups in California show the following income distribution. The Japanese, $3,567. The Chinese, $3,237. The Filipino, $3,046. The Negro, $2,610. The Indian, $2,244. The white median income is $3,697, and the overall state is $3,585. A brief analysis indicates that the Japanese are best off in terms of median income of all groups identified as non-white by the Census Department, and that they closely approach but are still slightly below the median income of the white group. Another way of looking at the progress of the Japanese is to analyze the percentage increase in professional jobs over a decade. In 1950, 29% of the Japanese held white-collar jobs as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau, 
and in 1960 the figure had risen to 40 percent or an increase of over 10 percent. For the same period the total white white collar employment was 44.5 percent in 1950 and 44.3 percent in 1960 or almost no change. No other group as listed in the census figures approached the Japanese percentage of progress at least as measured by entrance into white collar professions. Even more surprising would be jobs classified as professional. In 1950, 4.6% of the Japanese had this classification, while in 1960, approximately 17% of the group had this classification. Comparable figures for 1960 show approximately 5% of the Negroes in this category and 15% of the whites in this classification. I would like to thank Bob Singleton for lending me these figures. Uh, education. In terms of median years of completed years of schooling, the Japanese have completed 12.4 years, the Chinese 11.7, the Filipino 11.8, the Indian 10.1, the Negro 10.7, the overall state average 12.1. Therefore, in education, it can be seen that the Japanese are, again, the best off of all the non-white figures and also ahead of the overall state figures. The stereotype of the Japanese as a well-educated group appears to be confirmed by these figures. I would like to take a minute here to praise the system of education available here in California. Even though the Japanese suffered many indignities in their early years, the one source that was equally available was the free system of public schools extending from the kindergarten to the universities. I often wonder if the group would have advanced as rapidly if my, as well as other Japanese parents, landed, let us say, in Georgia or Alabama. Politics, this is an area I didn't mean to tie that in, but I guess it works. <laughs> this is an area where the Japanese have not been very active. Yet, we have one Nisei in the Senate and another in the House of Representatives. I have read of several mayors, of several members of various boards of education, as well as various appointive positions. Housing. Housing is another difficult area to assess for the Japanese. There is no question about the gains. For example, in a study which I directed in the San Francisco Bay Area several years ago, the rapid movement of the group to areas which were denied to them previously was quite notable. I am sure that there are still many problems in housing, but it is difficult to gather data since most Japanese would rather not talk about it. So, as you can see, we are doing quite well. We are rapidly becoming integrated into the larger American culture. And our rates of crime and delinquency are rising rapidly. <laughs> for, for example, in 1940, our rates of delinquency were 119 per 100,000. In 1950, it was 180, and in 1960, 450. I must add, however, that these rates are considerably lower than for the non-Japanese population. The current rate of 450 comparing with the general overall Los Angeles County rates of 1,481. And for the first time, we have Japanese psychiatrists, <laughs> psychologists, and social workers. We even have a social wel welfare agency to handle social problems arising in the community. It is my impression that separations and divorces are becoming more common. School dropouts are coming to light, and there appears to be less of an emphasis on scholastic achievement. And so, we make the full circle again and ask, where are we and where are we going? I believe that the Japanese are at a critical point 
in their adaptation to life in the United States. Many of the old community and family ties which were valuable in the past are being or have been dissolved. Many of the current generation are unaware of the past and their internalization of American standards and values is almost totally complete. Most perceive no alternatives and because of this their main hope lies in the ability of the larger American community to absorb them. Let me illustrate this last point with a concept I call role validation. The acquisition of values, standards, the retention of the knowledge of American mores and attitudes is not enough. For the role of being an American has to be validated through behavior. And this behavior has to be in interaction with the larger society, meaning you. The ethnic community is not large enough, nor does it provide sufficient opportunities for the current ambitious youngsters. They are ready, willing, and able, and need the larger area so that their potentialities can be developed to the fullest. Here, let me present this final point through an analogy. Let us assume that the Japanese want to become bridge players, and the dominant American community is holding the cards. Forty years ago, even if the American wanted the Japanese to play, there would be no deal. For the Japanese of that era would not have acquired the knowledge, skills, and attitudes for playing a game, and such a gesture would have been useless. Twenty-five years ago, there might have been some action, but not in the true sense of a game of bridge, that many Japanese may have acquired some of the attitudes and values, but most would be afraid to validate this knowledge through active participation with the larger culture. Surely, there would be some players, but most would probably have chosen to play within their own group. If the FBI and Army were called in, there would, of course, be some participation. But one could also be sure that the Japanese would not play to win. You would have had to provide the cards. The refreshments in the game would have been one-sided. Today, I think that things are quite different. We are ready. We have read and digested all of the bridge books. We have the knowledge, the values, the attitudes and skills necessary for successful participation in the larger culture. We will even bring the cards and we will play a good game. We want to win. We will take whatever risks are necessary for role validation with no excuses as to race or other handicaps. What I am saying very clearly is that we are ready for full participation in the larger society. The critical question then is addressed directly to you for I believe that we have done everything we can. It is a simple question. All it asks is, will you let us? Thank you very much.